Hi everyone, my name is Ryan Lures, and I'm an assistant professor of music at Lenore Ryan University on the Hickory campus and I direct the a cappella choir, the college singers, and work with future music educators and sacred musicians. I have degrees from Florida State University, Luther Seminary with St. Olaf College, and Luther College in Decorah, Iowa. This is week nine of this course, and this week we're going to consider how humans connect through art in times of crisis. There will be a particular emphasis on singing, since that's the area in which I have the most experience, but we'll also cover and give you a chance to explore um, instrumental music and visual art and poetry as well. So week nine objectives, which are on the screen. I'm going to ask you to describe the relationship between music making and human social connection. Explore the relationship between music and protest, given all the social unrest right now. We're also going to ask you to summarize the ways in which the current pandemic has impacted artistic expression, both in terms of uh, new art that's been inspired during this time, but also looking at ways uh, art has had to adapt to be transmitted and to connect with audiences. Uh, there are no places I'm aware of right now where there is live concerts happening inside uh, concert halls and, and large venues. So how, how are those ensembles, if they're meeting right now, how are they reaching their audiences? And we'll talk about that. And then finally, at the end, creating an original piece of art inspired by your own pandemic experience. Um, I'm just going to encourage you to go for it with this, with this project. And with the, uh, with the reminder that this is really about the process. Um, please don't worry too much about what the end product is, but do, do spend some time. Um, you have a variety of expressions from which you can choose. Pick one, go for it, talk about your experience, uh, and don't, don't lose sleep over this activity. The content for you is divided in, into three parts. Uh, broken up into three parts, uh, much like the um, the objectives we just looked at. First, we're going to look at music as a means to social connection, talk about that more broadly and then generally, and then specifically as music in protest settings, and then look at COVID-era artistic expressions. So there is considerable debate about the necessity of music, if it's a um, something that's needed and critical for human survival, or if it's something that's just kind of nice to have around. For instance, Darwin suggested that its only adaptive purpose is to help facilitate courtship. Others have said that it's played a much more important role, especially in the ancient world, uh, with human societies having to really work, uh, people within human society and cultures having to work really close with each other and trust each other to take care of things like raising children and finding food and going to battle and and worshiping together that music and art played a really important role in all of those elements it might be harder to argue for the necessity of music in modern society but yet it endures we still see communal music making and in this case i'm talking about music that's not rehearsed and performed in the concert hall but music that is unrehearsed and often spontaneous and um, has a has a end goal that is social often that exceeds the goal of making making art but is is really having something social in mind so we see that at sporting events especially soccer matches outside the united states um, in military settings and religious services college fight songs and Orion has its alma mater that gets sung. Um, and during the aftermath of natural tr national tragedy, which we'll talk about in a moment, and as part of protest movements, which we'll also talk about. On the screen, you see a mother with her, we're going to assume that's a mother with her infant child. Perhaps the most basic fundamental form of bonding is that between uh, a mother and an infant. Um, particularly with the mother's voice being what the most familiar sound to an infant. And we see singing from a parent to a child being important when trying to get the baby to fall asleep or trying to calm a baby down. So, and also there's a nurturing bonding that happens during that time. 
You also see the soccer match. And then in the bottom, perhaps, if I didn't say this already, the most form, uh, common form of, of unrehearsed singing in our culture is in worship settings. And probably my favorite quote about what might be going on here by Ellen Dissanayak. I'm talking about religious ceremony, especially in the ancient world, but I think it applies a lot to um, contemporary culture, too. She says, by joining with others in music and art-filled ceremonial behavior, individuals may have felt more a sense of coping with the uncertain circumstances addressed by the ceremony and thereby effects of the stress response were better ameliorated or made better than for those who went their own isolated ancient ways. So she's pointing to the phenomenon or the idea that by uh, participating in artistic expression with other people, we feel connected with them. And it's something that's gone on, seems like, throughout um, observable human history. As long as we've been worshiping, we've been doing music and artistic expressions. So underneath this phenomenon, uh, there are some physiological measures that folks have researched and give us a clue of what might be happening. There's a lot more work to be done here, but just some, um, some things to consider. First of all, there are increased levels of immuno, immunoglobulin A. I don't say that word very often. I practiced it and it still didn't come out right, but you can read it on the screen. This has been this has been linked to positive social um, positive social interactions. Also linked with singing is an increased level of oxytocin, uh, a hormone associated with human bonding, sometimes called the trust hormone. And finally, a 2013 study investigated singer heart rates and respiration, and they provided evidence that heart rates and respiration actually begin to sink as people sing together. And then they pose the question, well, if 80% of the neural traffic from um, the heart to the brain goes directly from the heart to the brain and hearts are being, heart rates are being synchronized with the people around you, does that help you have a common perspective with those around you when you're singing or help forge that? And um, can that actually lead to a change of behavior because you're singing where you're more likely to do the things and feel the same way about something as the people around you. So no conclusive evidence on that, but posing the question, if heart rates are synchronizing, is that impacting how people are thinking and perceiving what's going on around them because they're singing together? So now I'd like to play for you two videos that illustrate what we were just talking about. The first being a vigil after a 2015 Florida State shooting. So I was a student at Florida State at the time, if you look at the picture, you can't see me, but I am in a, a crowd of, a, I don't know, five or 6,000 people attending this event the day after there was a shooting in our university's library. Um, I think three people were shot. One person was paralyzed for life after that. One person died, and that was the shooter himself. He was killed by campus police. So a tragic event. Um, even if you didn't know the people involved, there was a sense of being violated and a sense of fear and uncertainty when something like that happens on your campus. So the community gathered, you can kind of predict these days what an event like that looks like. The university president spoke. Uh, I think the Tallahassee mayor spoke with similar messages of of um, offering thoughts and condolences to those involved. I think some mental health professionals spoke about how we can go about coping in the, the wake of tragedy, such as that there were performances by a choir, the band there that you can see, the marching chiefs who performed some solemn music. So very predictable event. When it was done, though, as we were leaving towards its end, somebody started the FSU war chant, which is this, you know, tomahawk chop and, and singing together that is usually often reserved for football games, but somebody decided, took it upon themselves to start it in this event. And of course, it wouldn't have been planned because it's it's a war chant and we're at an event where we are um, trying to grapple with violence on our campus. It seems perhaps not prudent to sing a war chant in response to violence. 
But anyways, somebody started it, and I'll let you watch the video to see what happens next. So I share that video with you again because I was there. I had my own experience, my own feelings. I'm not going to project them on the entire group, but I will point out that, man, there were a lot of people around me who were in tears. There was, I would say, I, it felt like 100% participation, almost like it was involuntary that you were caught up in that moment, that communal expression of song in the wake of that, that tragedy. And to bring Brene Brown into this week's conversation as well, I think she has some good verbiage for what might be happening. And she says that artistic expression is, is healthy and notable because it can address both grief and hope simultaneously. And that, even though I read that after the fact, that really resonated with me, this idea that we were doing something where we could express our, our grief and then address the fear that we were having with a hope that we were going to be okay. We weren't okay yet, but we were all in this together and we were going to be stronger than the fear that had invaded our campus. The second example is from 9-11. Um, this is a pretty famous one, I think. And it is Congress gathering on the steps of the Capitol the evening after planes flew into the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. And again, like the Florida State Vigil, the, the the event is done and somebody starts singing in this case god bless america and i'll play that for you here's the speaker of the house and dennis haster the So an important display of, of unity, Democrat, Republican, didn't matter. They were singing together in what was probably one of the most um, horrifying days in our country's recent history. So some similarities between these two events. If you want to pause for a moment and think of yourself, you want to compare and contrast, you can do that. Otherwise, I'm going to uh, propose some similarities for you, both of them. Happened in the context of tragedy and uncertainty. In both cases, the music was spontaneous. It wasn't even written down that they were going to happen, from what I could tell. It's somebody 
just starting it themselves. One person deciding, you know what, I think we should sing right now. And just think to yourself, how many social situations is it acceptable just to start singing and you're going to have a group of people join in with you. But it seems like people are maybe more open to that in this type of a setting, a context of tragedy and uncertainty. And finally, the music in both cases was familiar, an obvious ingredient necessary for spontaneous participation if you haven't passed out music and you haven't rehearsed it yet. It's sung from memory, which also allows for there to be some social interaction while the singing is going on. You can look at each other and look around you and acknowledge other people. Overall, though, this type of music making, communal music making without rehearsal is rare, especially outside of churches. And it, it, it leads us into the next topic, which is singing in protest. And I just want to highlight the reading I have for you before you launch into it. I'm not going to read that whole quote. But um, as you're reading this, reflect on music in your own life. Do you, do you find yourself singing with other people in unrehearsed settings? It's one thing you're from a choir, but... Uh, does your family sing? Is, do people around you sing in a group? And the author of this article you're about to read is Michael, Michael Handler, and he suggests uh, in the words that are in the red that we expect the professionals to do the singing and that we, the audience, should listen and live stream. That seems to be an attitude that's held by many in our culture right now. So keep that in mind as you read this article. And one more thing. Please make sure you watch the video in the middle of the article, Issei Barnwell leading singing in the context of an actual recent protest. So with that, I'll let you do the reading. I'll see you in a little bit when we get to the second video.